Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now last year, Sri Lanka's economy collapsed. Did it collapse due to mismanagement or was there a systematic push by various powers to get us there? Which itself is a different argument. Anyway, once our economy collapsed, you would have seen multitudes of key notable people from the West calling, visiting and talking about Sri Lanka. The United States is at the top. We saw key figures from the State Department and the CIA arriving in this country to hold conversations with our leaders. In a speech to military officials recently, President Rani Wickremesinghe alerted us as to why this is. Sagarate, Pacific Sagare, a Danatamati, you know, Indian Sagarate again had the no, Lanka, a Mambalani, a Puluan Tarang, a Kiwatkan, Koma, a Pini, Indian Sagare, Mada. The Meta Tuanu, a Picohoma, the Anaga, the Ekan Muna den Nikida, Avidia Tamai, Ape Araksha, Alut, Upakrama, Sakas Krantathean, a pity a current woman, I Muda Mokaksidu Apidan. Gone Mokakwe Apidane Hadise Ape Godabi Mahamudav Loka Venat Tenakata. I want to feed you either Well, as the president said, we see the attention of the United States shifting uh, its focus on the Indian Ocean and countries around the Indian Ocean. Currently, the United States has got the support of Singapore, India, Bangladesh, and somewhat from Indonesia. Why? Well, the US need them to counter China. The reason for this is very straightforward. Every financial analyst, every social analyst, and every security analyst in the United States and the collective West says that within a very short period of time, I think around within a decade, China will become the world's superpower. Now that terrifies the United States because they don't want to lose their top position. So they need to do everything possible to ensure they safeguard that position. How do they do that? Well. America's way of engagement is not negotiation. Their way mostly is shrewdly creating chaos so that they can get their way. Divide and rule, which is a, a page from the playbook of the colonial British Empire. The best example is uh, in recent times is the unrest uh, in this country last year. If you put things uh, into context, what happened was a government that said that they would never go to the IMF, aka the United States, in fact was overthrown and the rest then went there obediently. The people who screamed uh, from the current government saying that we will never go to the IMF is now singing praises. Even though this sounds speculative, uh, when we look at the Biden administration's new strategy for South Asia, we see how they want to ensure that um, and, and use this region in their uh, overall fight against China. And China is uh, strong in these parts of the world, mainly in trade. Look at Sri Lanka, most of the Chinese influence is about business, not security or politics. They don't push Sri Lanka uh, cunningly to positions where we have to change our way of governance to create a better uh, environment for China. This is why the Biden administration came up with a new strategy, as I just mentioned, uh, titled Indo-Pacific Strategy, which was uh, released by the White House last February. What exactly do they try to do through this strategy and what is their focus? Well, joining me now uh, from the data board is Danidu Vithanavasam. Danidu, good to see you once again. Happy New Year, Danidu. Uh, now, what exactly uh, does this strategy talk about, the Indo-Pacific strategy that was released by the White House by the Biden administration? Does it talk uh, about how America is helping the countries in South Asia? Or is it uh, the roadmap to get these countries into a position that they want them to be in? Right. Happy New Year to you as well, Mahesh. Uh, I think you mentioned China multiple times within the intro to this segment, and that is exactly what they have focused on. Now, as a document, Mahesh, what they have differentiated it into is firstly to identify what the promise of the Indo-Pacific region is, the strategy, and then the action plan. Now, a lot of details that have been given under it, which I'm not going to go into, but just really focus on the particular things that are important to our country. Under the promise, they look at 900 billion US dollars in FDIs. Now, we don't see that uh, much of a problem. 
But within the promise itself, they identify repetitively that the People's Republic of China is a quote, coercive and aggressive force in this region. And that is what their focus is going to primarily be on. And that is the reason why there's an Indo-Pacific strategy. Now, within the strategy portion of this, now it has also been divided into five key objectives. We don't really have to go into that. But one thing, Mahesh, I believe that you'll also find interesting is that the, in, under the first objective, which is to advance a free and open Indo-Pacific, they talk about supporting investigative journalism. Now we see that this is something that they had focused on even during the Aragalia time period. We are not too sure about how a state gets to infiltrate into that level when it comes to another country's affairs because that we particularly think journalism is something that a state as a homegrown thing that should come up from a country. But that is also part of their, uh, part of their focus. Another thing that is interesting is fiscal transparency, which has been mentioned in the document as well. Fiscal transparency is also another objective within the Indo-Pacific strategy, within, the, uh, within their strategy, and then primarily the action plan as well. So those are some two specific aspects I believe that we need to pay attention to within the Biden administration. Journalism. That's a good one. Uh, well, that's what America is doing all around the world. As always, that in the Uthan was at the data world. Thank you very much. Now, meanwhile, a new alliance among China, Russia, Pakistan, and Iran might stir things up in the Indian Ocean. A Western think tank called the GIS says that Russia and Iran have become as friendly as their mutual interest in foreign and security policy alarms. And Pakistan has become a main transit corridor for China, delivering access to the Indian Ocean through the southern port, uh, port city of Gauda. The same possibility is open now for Russia through Iranian ports leading to the Indian Ocean. The question at hand is how can Sri Lanka benefit from this or do we actually have anything to benefit from? So we must be proactive and ensure that we get the best deal for us and for our people from events unfolding in the world. If America wants to be here, instead of allowing them to rape us economically, politically and socially, we must ensure that we deal with them as partners and benefit. Same with China and Russia. Some time back, uh, for, uh, former Foreign Secretary and the current Sri Lankan Ambassador to Indonesia, Admiral Janath Kolomagi, told me the best analogy of what Sri Lanka is, in, uh, is like now. Watch. Are we a small country, right? In size, yes, we are. In population, we are. But look at the attention that this little country is getting, right? Whether it is coming from USA, India, China, Australia, EU, Japan, we are the center of attraction, right? Because of the geographical location, the geostrategic value of this country. So therefore, I would argue, we are a big power. Yeah. Well, that was the uh, current Indonesian, uh, Sri Lankan ambassador to Indonesia, Admiral Janath uh, Kolomagi. Now, I want to understand how important it is uh, for the United States to embed itself in this part of the world. For that, joining me now is Associate Professor at Rabdan Academy in Abu Dhabi, Professor John Harrison. He joins me via Zoom. Professor Harrison is also a regional security expert. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your time. Now, if you had uh, the chance to read the Indo-Pacific strategy released by the White House in February of last year, they clearly say, Professor, that uh, the USA would focus on every corner of the region, uh, especially from Northeast Asia to South Asia to Oceania. Now, what does this mean? Does it mean that they will look towards uh, infiltrating these countries and uh, make them work for the USA uh, for going their sovereignty? What are you reading from this? Well, thank you, Mahesh. Um, the first thing, uh, I have had the chance to look at it, and I'm not sure I agree with the premise of your question, where uh, this is some sort of nefarious uh, intent for the U.S. to infiltrate and override uh, national sovereignty. What this is about is the U.S. Uh, sort of telling itself, plus the world, that its focus is going to broaden in Asia. It's not going to be just the Middle East and just counterterrorism. It's going to, once again, re-engage with the entire region on a broad spectrum of issues, uh, everything from regular geopolitical actions to certainly counterterrorism, but a whole series of economic, security, and social issues that will give the U.S. and I think the region a much broader sense of cooperation and many more points uh, to do that. The U.S. has had dealings with all the nations in the region, and I don't think there's anything uh, subtle or secret about uh, the U.S. effort. What it does mean is that the U.S. is going to use all the tools uh, that a nation has available to it 
to engage in and correspond to and construct a foreign policy. So it's no longer going to be just one part of Asia that's going to be the focus or one issue. It is going to be a much broader base and a much richer uh, opportunity for the United States to cooperate with nations across the region uh, and across Asia, but also a much broader opportunity for those nations to find points of cooperation with the United States as well. Uh, certainly there's competition going on across the world now. Uh, we've seen the outbreak of conflicts in other regions. And I think it's in very important for the U.S. to be able to focus on and bring other nations together to try to prevent any future, future conflicts. Okay. Uh, Professor, many analysts say that there would, be, uh, there not, would not be a war, a physical war, to be exact, uh, between U.S. and China, mainly because they are entangled with trade. But we have seen, on the other hand, that those very analysts are also saying that China will become the world's strongest economy in a few years. So in a context like that, what kind of threats will countries in the Indian Ocean face in the need uh, for the U.S. to be the dominant superpower? Uh, Mahesh, this is a very interesting and important question, uh, not only for the United States and China, but obviously for Asia and the rest of the world. First of all, I'm not totally convinced that uh, the Chinese will become the largest economy in meaningful sense. Uh, certainly, its sheer size will make it very important, and it is already important. But there are still so many inhibitors to China being able to develop to a position where it will be the world's largest and strongest economy. And I think those are two very different, uh, very different points. There is a competition going on with between the United States and China, and there's no doubt about that. Both countries have been very obvious. Economics do not dictate foreign policy, as we've seen with the recent events in places like uh, Ukraine and Russia, where economic integration is not the genesis of the conflict. Certainly, there should be efforts to avoid, to avoid military and armed conflict, but that may not be possible. And economics doesn't offset national interests. But certainly cooperation, collaboration, communication are ways to help manage potential conflicts and to try to make sure that the region does not break out into a hot conflict. If the premise is that conflict is inevitable between two nations, and I don't believe that necessarily is the case, but if that is the premise, then yes, cooperation and economics are important to try to manage that. And if that conflict uh, is inevitable, and again, I don't agree, but if it is, then perhaps a cold war of some sort, whatever that the term is going to mean in this, is certainly a better way of dealing with these issues than an actual hot armed conflict. When we, we've already thought that the world had gone past state-on-state uh, -state, uh, conflict, we've seen since last February that is not the case. So any effort to try and maneuver and to try to dampen those thrusts are very important. And as Mahesh, I'm sure your, uh, your um, listeners would, uh, would certainly agree with that comment. Absolutely. Uh, Professor, in terms of uh, foreign policy interest, what should Sri Lanka be focusing on right now? That's a fascinating question. And I think, you know, certainly there's a great deal of interest right now and understandable need to focus on uh, internal dynamics and internal politics. But Sri Lanka has a unique opportunity because the international system seems to be going through a change, uh, moving from the unipolar moment right after the end of the Cold War to a more multipolar uh, environment. And Sri Lanka, because of its geopolitical position, has unique opportunities to be able to leverage that and I think the first thing it needs to do is get its internal politics and internal economic situation in order so that it can begin to see, well, what is its basic national interest? How does the international system either, co either enhance or inhibit the, those interests? And what tools of national power does Sri Lanka have to be able to shape the environment for itself, to be able to take advantage of the situation that it does find itself in? It is very rare. That, we that nations find themselves in a position where the international community is changing and seems to be changing so rapidly that they have an, an opportunity and a moment to be able to shape those interests and to be able to shape the world's community in its own interests and likes. Sri Lanka is not going to be able to certainly dictate to China or the United States or India or anyone else, nor does it want to. But what it wants to be able to do is maximize its position to, to achieve its own interests. What those are may not be clear at the moment, but I think that's the most important thing you can do. Find out what those interests are, how those interact with the domestic political situation, and then how to make sure that the country can be able to utilize all the tools of national power that it has 
to be able to develop and influence the world in a way that will benefit not only Sri Lanka and South, e- and South Asia, but the world in general. All right, we have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was the Associate Professor at the Ramdan Academy in Abu Dhabi, Professor John Harrison. Let's take a short commercial break. On the other side, did China really bankrupt Sri Lanka? Stick around. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment.